I'm Dana Sanchez. I'm uh, on the faculty at OSU's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, and I'm our state uh, extension specialist. And I'm really pleased to be asked to be here. I'm going to run through a really short um, presentation just on some of the basic tactics that I advise people when they're trying to prevent and manage uh, conflicts with wildlife. So this won't go in really in depth, and but hopefully it'll give us, give us some background. So. <laughs> All right, well, um, just a, a quick reminder that having our native uh, wildlife and fish species in place and in functioning ecosystems is really beneficial to us. They provide things called ecosystem services that we don't always remember are going on uh, behind the scenes that do benefit us. And I highlighted a couple that would probably be of greatest interest to those of us in the room today. Um, but on the other hand, um, the animals, although they don't think about it really consciously, are, are after an agenda. And their agenda is to survive, basically, and survive long enough to produce high quality offspring that can pass on their genes. And tied back to that agenda, as I call it, is a really uh, core concept of what we call habitat. And habitat uh, at a conceptual level is a combination of factors, uh, biotic and abiotic, that just means living and non-living, so if you think non-living like soil type, things like that, that are necessary to a specific species to uh, show up there and live there, so occupy the place, to survive, and then ultimately to reproduce um, and pass on their genes. Now most of the time we're thinking uh, for habitat the elements would be food, water, and cover, or shelter. And when we're faced with potential conflicts with animals, it's because they're thinking that something we have or we value is fulfilling part of their needs in this way. And some of our tactics can be to make this look like not such a great place to hang out, to avoid the conflict. The conflicts Generally, when I'm talking about uh, managing and preventing human wildlife conflicts, I'm talking to folks like master gardeners, homeowners, people with outbuildings, things like that, where the number one conflict they are immediately aware of is when critters get into and occupy structures that they, we don't want them in. So your house, your uh, shed, sometimes even the vehicle becomes a little home for little guys. Um, and then the other big one is when they eat something we would like them not to eat. Um, and in your case, it's probably the highest interest is something that would be a production crop. Uh, animals can also cause problems with infrastructure. I'm thinking here, uh, most likely in your case, is fences and other structures used to support your main crop. Um, sometimes they actually structurally harm or destroy the crop itself. I know in a uh, wheat country, for example, a small band of elk can come in and they won't eat all the crop, but they will lie on it, tramp on it, you know, it's like the greatest pillow top mattress ever, mm -hmm. and it's gone. So, and then uh, finally, sometimes animals are become into conflict with us because they pose an actual physical risk. That could be direct as in running into clawing, biting, or indirect, such as bringing in disease or parasites, such as tick diseases. So the basic tactics I wanted to talk to you about today are blocking or excluding, deterring, and removing animals. And then underlying all those is that we're usually most successful when we can, what I would say is changing the game or using multiple tactics at one time. So one part of changing the game is, I mentioned the habitat draw, so animals are looking food, water, shelter, things like that. If there's something bringing them in to explore an area and then they're getting in trouble with us, if we can remove the draw sometimes, we can remove the conflict. Uh, typically that is uh, really well highlighted in homeowner situations where, for example, we'll be feeding birds and getting skunks and raccoons that are coming in for the spilled bird food or coming in to share in Fido's dinner that's left on the back porch and all of a sudden we have a wildlife conflict 
and nobody knew they were doing anything to attract the wildlife. Um, combining and alternating uh, tools is something you've already heard about. So, for example, the resistance uh, groups, that's one example of kind of changing the game on some pests. I would say that that's going to be a core part of what I talk about today, too, with various groups of animals. <laughs> so one of the first steps um, when you know that you're having a conflict or you can anticipate that you're going to have a conflict with some sort of wildlife species is to learn as much as you can about the life cycle of that species. For example, some of the animals that might cause us problems in a vineyard are migratory versus others are not. Uh, some have seasonal peaks in population abundance because uh, the kids get old enough and the parents kick them out and all of a sudden you see a whole bunch of them moving across the landscape. Things like that. Assessment of tolerance and basically the cost benefit of actually doing battle and trying to deal with the problem is a really important step too. If you have a mole or two I noticed a ground squirrel hole or two over there <laughs> in the, the landscaping. Maybe that's a tolerable level of disturbance. If you're seeing ground squirrels across your entire area, that's probably not a tolerable level of disturbance for you. And some of our wildlife issues really need to be managed on what I would call the neighborhood level or the neighboring landowner scale. Um, this is especially the case with, uh, in urban areas, our turkey issues. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, my new Murphy's Law, bylaw, I guess I would call it, is that if you have a turkey problem at house A, it means within three houses somebody's feeding the little guys. Um, <laughs> and um, in your case, it would probably be more uh, applicable to those wider ranging animals, such as, as deer, bands of elk, things like that. And then wherever we can, when we can use that first option on my list, the blocking or excluding, that's going to be where we can do that, probably one of the best options. But definitely uh, using multiple tactics is going to be very important. So I've already mentioned the assessment step. How serious is the problem? Um, what kinds of health or safety concerns might be involved? What's the context? And what's the likelihood that this is a one-time deal versus a recurring problem? So I had the opportunity to work uh, a little bit with Patty Skinkus on campus about some of the, the wine growing guides and some of the usual suspects that came out of those conversations were these guys. Um, so how many of you in, in this room have had issues with mountain beaver on your Really? Okay. I don't know. I wasn't sure. I didn't really have a lot in there because I was like, well, I'm not sure. They might be borderline. So mountain beaver are likely more, uh, more of an issue where you have wooded area. Do you have wooded area up against? Okay. Um, and moles? Are moles an issue? Yeah? Okay. Interesting. So for the next time, I'll, I'll develop on them a little bit more. It's interesting, the moles. Is they are definitely diggers, and they disturb soil, and they, they do the little rototilling under the surface. But most moles in Oregon are um, looking for worms <laughs> and grubs. So they're actually doing us a favor, but their, their um, secondary effect is rototilling. Now the bigger moles, the Townsend mole, they're the, because of their body size, they need a little bit richer diet, and that's where they get in trouble with us because then they do snack on plant material too. So, um, so I'm going to, the rest of this time, I'm going to try to keep it really short here is just spinning through from deter, uh, from block to deter to removal. And then you get to talk and hear from the real expert on the sorts of uh, chemical tools we have for dealing with some of these, the smaller guys here. So starting with the fencing, the, the blocking, keeping them out. Fencing, stout, lasting fencing is going to be an expensive, hopefully a one-time investment but it, it will last. Um, so for fencing out Bambi or deer, you want at least six, six and a half feet tall, maybe up to eight feet high. And I highlight, can I highlight here? Yeah. Um, the topography. So deer, I will admit, I really like critters and wildlife. Um, I, I can just go on and on about how cool the ecology of critters are. 
But I'll have to tell you this about deer. They are not rocket scientists, okay? They, on, the, on the whole wildlife spectrum, they're not super, super bright. But they can figure out if there's a little roll in the land that lowers your fence by just a little bit, they will find that spot and they will beat a path to that spot. So sometimes we have to really overbuild our fences to uh, prevent them from doing that. The little suckers can also crawl under uh, <laughs> these fences. So if you have dogs or raccoon or skunk or fill in the blank that's made a little path under the fence and then eventually the fence fabric gets lifted up a little bit, if it gets not very far up, deer will try to go under it. I've even seen elk make it under some amazingly small holes. So. Uh, we have to maintain our fences. Some folks are using an electric wire along the top. Um, I have a little highlight here. If you're going to use electricity, it has to be turned on to work. Uh, I won't go on and on about that. That seems really obvious, but one of the things that can uh, confound us when we're trying to use electric wire is that stuff happens outside. Branches fall down moss grows, lichen grows on things, and it'll cut the charge. And I'll tell you what, again, deer, not rocket scientists, but they test fences constantly. And as soon as they know it's off, it's not a big deal. Uh, some folks are actually wanting to uh, allow uh, predator passage to help manage some of the smaller critters that causes problems, so they want to make sure that say coyotes, bobcats can still get through their fields or barriers. Sometimes we have to be thoughtful about where we put electric wire to make sure that we're letting the good guys in and keeping Bambi out, things like that. The biggest question about fencing is, is it feasible to fence off an area to target the critter that you're having problems with? Deer and elk, if you can uh, really identify where they're coming in the most. You can strategize where to put that blockage. Um, when we get closer to suburban and urban areas, we often start having to deal with things that can climb short fences and dig under things. And one of the, this little apron of fence here, I'm going to show another example of that. If you've got an area that is feasible to fence, then it, and you're having issues with things like rabbit and some of our digging uh, rodents and, and insectivores, then doing an apron of fence along the bottom so it goes down and then underneath so that if they dig right near the fence, they're hitting metal <laughs> steel mesh and they can't get in. Um, if you're going to the, the trouble of building that fence, adding one of these is probably not a bad idea. Other blocking solutions that I'm sure you're already very familiar with include individual plant uh, protection guards such as vine and stem guards and netting. Uh, I remember Patty got a hold of me last year around this time saying some folks had invested in netting which is you know, a significant uh, investment not just for the netting but also whatever framework you're using to hold that off and saying, hey, the birds didn't show up. But that's one of those situations where the seasonality of the problem means if you've got the netting on hand and you see that the birds are starting to come in, you can deploy. If they're not, you don't have to bother with it. Uh, one of the things that I have learned is that in drier years, we tend to see a little more bird problem on the early varietals. And this so far is a relatively dry year. February was the third or fourth driest. So we'll have to see how things play out, but this might be one of the years to, to get the nets ready. Um, okay, deterring by taste. There are a lot of products out there. Bottom line is you have to reapply them because if they're going to deter something from eating whatever the product is, they have to get the nasty taste in their mouth. So generally when I'm, I'm working with homeowners and master gardeners, they say, if we're deterring by taste, that means the animal's already up to your plant and they have it in their mouth, which concerns me. Um, when you're talking big tracts of land like you all are managing, sometimes this might be the, the first level of defense. And uh, there's a lot of great research by APHIS, that's the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, it's online and I will give you a link to that soon. 
I'm running over, I'm sorry. Um, hazing is basically scaring the bejesus out of things <laughs> with noises, lights, uh, explosions, things like that. If you're rural enough, you can probably get a permit and some assistance, technical assistance in deploying this. If you're too close to houses, because it'll also scare the bejesus out of everybody near you, you might not be able to. Um, there's some guides there, some phone numbers, and uh, you have a copy of this, so if we want to distribute the slides, that's just dandy. I found out um, actually yesterday that Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, the district office in Corvallis has a couple of the rotating propane cannons out for, for lending, but only a couple of them, and it's kind of like a tryout, see if it that will work, so if you're considering that. Now that's out of Corvallis. One of the other tools I'm going to give you is a phone number if you haven't found it already for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. We all have a district biologist. And their districts, how they break things up, do not run by <laughs> county lines or city lines. You have to call headquarters, give them your address, and tell them where the field is you'd be working on. And they can tell you who your main contact is to get uh, resources such as that. So if you're going to use things like rubber bullets, bangers, propane cannons, <laughs> you do need some permits. So it's something you do need to work ahead to make sure you have the proper permitting available. Okay, so birds are a really good example of where multiple tactics um, come in. You do need a little information on birds. So, so there are some that you can remove with permits. Okay, so things like crows, uh, you can get permission from the state to, to remove those. There are at least one, no, two, right off the top of my head, you can remove without permits. House sparrows and starlings. And I'm sure you've all been overrun at various times wherever you live here in the valley by starlings. Please take out as many of them as you can. Um, and then the majority of birds we cannot remove. They are protected federally, in fact, many of them internationally. Um, so it's important to know who you're dealing with. Break out the binoculars. If you don't have the, the skill or the, the uh, the confidence to identify the bird, get somebody to help you out. Say, what are those? Are those red-winged blackbirds or, or is that a starling? So that you know who you're dealing with. Um, and then finally, combining the blocking, deterring, and removal. Um, one of the steps I have on here is letting hawks and excipitors. Excipitors are, are bird-eating hawks. They're like the little uh, fighter jet guys you see flying around, highly maneuverable. Nature evolved them to kill birds, <laughs> so let them help out. You're going to hear a lot more about the, the poisoning part and the baiting part of these little guys. Um, there are really species-specific traps for each of these fellows and techniques, and I don't have the time to go into them again, um, but I can point you to resources. Again, let predators help where we can. Historically in our country, we've really persecuted predators. We figured if it killed something, it was bad. But we're finding more and more that if we let some of those predators hang out, they can help us out. They'll never wipe them all out, but they can help. And when you're being overrun with voles, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you're glad to have all the help you can get. A couple of these fellows, especially this guy and this guy, are known to have what we call eruptive, not erupt like St. Helens, but eruptive as in population spikes. They have eruptive populations every five to seven years. We're covered with voles, okay? It's highly unpredictable, uh, but we, we know it when it's happening. Uh, the source that I use for my trap, uh, my species specific trapping, is right here. It's on the web. Beware of the chemical recommendations. They're out of date. But the trapping advice in there is excellent. Um, I've also got some notes here on ways that we can allow the native predators to help. So we can uh, build raptor perches. If you don't have high trees or something like that near the edges of your fields. We can provide them pretty cheaply. You don't have to do a lot of them. 
If you have barn owls in your area, barn owls are crazy good at killing things like voles. <laughs> They're really good at it. Um, but we don't have barn owls everywhere. They're very common, but they're very local. If you have them though, they're really easy to con into using a box and setting up housekeeping. So, uh, bats, they eat, what was it? Something like 2,000 pounds of bugs a year, several bats. So use them. And like I said, if we allow coyotes and bobcats free range, they will eat some of those. Uh, this slide has information, not only one great resource uh, is the, the state trained wildlife control operators. Uh, so you can contact and locate your most local person there. Here are the phone numbers for getting a hold of who is my local district biologist to help me uh, with technical information. And then APHIS. APHIS comes in when you have uh, basically hordes of fill in the blank attacking whatever you're working on. Usually starlings, geese, uh, they've done some of the, the landmark work with mountain beaver, things like that. When we need special permitting and uh, federal assistance to, to deal with some of these problems, I go to the folks at APHIS. All right, so I have run totally over my time. I apologize. I am yielding <laughs> to Rose, who can oh, tell you no. about far more of the uh, direct. No, that was so interesting. Eh? She's <laughs> probably more interesting than what I can talk about. But, um, you know, uh, you know, we actually have one of those SLNs for mountain beaver. You know, yes. Yeah. Forestry. Yeah. Forestry. That's how I was going. I was hearing that and wondering, that's still in effect, right? Yeah, that's still in effect. But it was uh, kind of, uh, I guess it was hard to conduct the studies because the female mountain beavers would steal the packets of, of rodenticide out of these burrows. And so they'd go to a, one mountain beaver burrow and there would be no packets, another one would be nine packets. So it's sometimes hard to do that kind of research. So I will try not to run over. So I might be going kind of fast here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about rodenticides and other pesticide uh, risks. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about regulatory history, types of rodenticides, how some of them work, uh, some of the challenges in detecting harm whenever you're using uh, pesticides, uh, some of the rodenticides you might uh, be able to use around your agricultural buildings and uh, why you can't use some of them in your crops and what rodenticides you can use in grapes. Just to give you a little regulatory history, uh, EPA's predecessor, the USDA, first regulated vertebrate control agents after uh, FIFRA, or ac actually after Congress passed FIFRA in 1947. And this was when uh, EPA first registered zinc phosphide, which we still use today, uh, Strict 9, which is still legal, and something called red squeal, which is not legal. So here it is 60 years later, and we're still using some of these products. So uh, rodenticides are put into two main groups. Uh, one would be the anticoagulants, and the other the non-anticoagulants. The anticoagulants are split into two different groups, the first generation and the second generation. The first generation having warfarin, chlorofastinone, and difastinone. Um, warfarin is only used for rats and mice. Uh, chlorofastinone and difastinone do have some agricultural uses. Difastinone in, particularly, in particular is used for ground squirrels. Then you have the second genera uh, generation anticoagulants, and I'll talk more about those uh, later. Then the non-anticoagulants, uh, uh, cocalciferol, which um, I'll show you a label. They actually have something for that. There's actually one OMRI certified. Zinc phosphide, uh, bromethylene, which is a nerve poison. Strychnine is a nerve poison. And then something um, called acrolein, which you won't be using here. So for the anticoagulants, they're basically vitamin K antagonists. They disrupt the uh, normal blood clotting and they uh, introduce capillary damage. It was first discovered, it's kind of interesting how these things happen, in the 1920s, they noticed a bunch of cows dying. 
and they were just basically bleeding to get death in a couple of different states. And so they went back trying to figure out why all these cows were dying. And they realized that there was some moldy sweet clover silage. And so they try to figure out, you know, what is it in this silage that's causing these animals to, to bleed to death? So they ended up thinking, well, that's kind of an interesting thing. And then they synthesized it in uh, 1948. And then they, um, this is warfarin. And then they uh, registered it as a uh, rodenticide in 1952. And then in 1954, it became legal for uh, humans. In fact, we, you know, you, we do have it for people who have heart conditions and they need a blood thinner. They're, it's actually a, a form of rodenticide. So it's, I won't go through this whole vitamin K cycle for you, but just to let you know that these anticoagulants affect vitamin K at two different areas. So some of the early symptoms of uh, co uh, anticoagulant uh, poisoning, if you were to go to a hospital, they, one of the first things they would do is they'd look at your clotting time. So let's say you had a, a dog that got into it, they would look at the clotting time. Uh, some of the symptoms that people might have would be um, bruising, early bleeding. We used to have an SLN, a special local knee that Linda talked about for the use of um, anticoagulant. It was a liquid and it was for use in orchards. And I thought, oh, you know, this doesn't seem so safe. I mean, you could be out there uh, doing all kinds of activities, not knowing that you were walking through basically an anticoagulant and you could get some kind of absorption, not know wh why your uh, cut wasn't healing. So we actually ended up canceling that. And then if you are exposed to a lot of it, you do bleed to death. And that's what happens to rodents. So the first generation of anticoagulants, they're a lot less toxic than the second generation. They're a lot more uh, rapidly metabolized, excreted out of the system. Uh, that uh, rodent needs to have multiple feedings of it, not just once, they have to keep going back to it. And there's actually a resistance that is an issue, which is why we ended up with the second generation. So those are actually retained in the bodies uh, a lot longer. In fact, this retention is one of the reasons that we have a, a problem sometimes with secondary poisoning, which I'll talk about. Um, it's actually lethal after one feeding, but they keep feeding. So they're not dead. They don't know they're, they're in the process of dying, and they keep feeding. And so they become what we call super lethal. They have a lot in their body right before their death. They kind of, because they're in the process of dying, they're not that smart acting, and they're actually a little bit more susceptible for uh, predation because they're not that, they're a little kind of out of it, and so they'll be wandering around while hawks around. So if you think of a kind of a smart rodent versus one that's under the influence of anticoagulants, you'll know which one the hawk will get. And they are more acutely toxic. Some of the advantages of anticoagulants is that you don't uh, you don't really have an aversion. Like the the rodent doesn't sense that it's eaten something toxic, and so they'll just keep going back to it. It's not like strychnine or zinc phosphide where they'll eat it and start feeling really bad. They won't they won't have that bad feeling. So you don't have the bait shyness. So they'll keep on eating it. Um, and there's an anti, there is actually an antidote for them, which is uh, really good. I actually had a situation where my dog ate some and almost died, and uh, luckily there was an antidote for it. Bromethylene, which is uh, a fairly common uh, non-anticoagulant rodenticide, it's a nerve poison, does not have an antidote, and that one is used by homeowners. It's a neurotoxin, and uh, the uh, positive thing is, though, the animal stops eating it after a while. It doesn't just keep on eating it like the anticoagulants. Then we have zinc phosphide, which we use a lot of in this state. We're a really big user. Uh, Dana mentioned the voles. 
I myself have granted a, quite a number of zinc phosphide registrations, and one of the reasons that I've granted these registrations is because there's not secondary poisoning. We have so many hawks here, uh, kestrels, owls, and so forth. Um, you know, they're all poisons, and they're all kind of scary that way. I mean, we're, we're pretty darn close to a rodent. It's not like a fungicide. Um, the way an animal would die from con uh, eating zinc phosphide is it forms a phosphine gas, and they die as soon as it hits like an acidic environment. Then we have another one, which is vitamin D3, cocalciferol. Cocalciferol. And um, that usually takes three to four days for an animal to die, but it's kind of interesting to think of a vitamin as actually being a toxicant. And then we have uh, at least one OMRI approved product. So now I'm going to talk about some of the challenges uh, we have in regulatory and even in, in the scientific community to detect harm that we have from pesticides. Um, most of the time it's, it's not seen and this is part of the problem. There could be some death going on in that we don't know about it. Um, you know, there could even be sublethal types of effects that we can't see. If we're going to see harm, it's going to be with mortality. We'll see dead birds or dead fish. Um, one of the things we try to do is we try to detect that harm as quickly as possible. Sometimes uh, if we don't collect, uh, detect it as possible, pesticide records get lost, people's memory uh, changes, uh, animals get scavenged or they decompose, making it difficult to figure out like what really killed this animal because it's, uh, the, the bodies may be broken down. Uh, scavengers and predators really do uh, put a lot of pressure on, on, uh, on basically carcasses. In fact, there was uh, some research done where uh, a researcher put out 78 carcasses and it was four different songbirds and he put it in a bunch of different cornfields. And within, um, within 24 hours, 69 to 92% of those carcasses were scavenged. And so if there had been an incident, and you, unless you were out there right away, you wouldn't know it. Um, also, when you're looking at carcasses, it depends on the type of, of uh, die-off. So if you have a really large uh, scale die-off where you have uh, a lot of big animals where you know you just can't get a number, uh, uh, enough scavengers, let's say you have 200 Canada geese die, I mean, how many scavengers would you take? So, really, so if the, the bigger the animal, the, the greater chance you'd have of finding them. Uh, some of the complications, as I found out, is sometimes with these large scale die offs, it really attracts even more scavengers to the area. And so, there was this uh, incident where uh, there's an insecticide called endosulfan. And so there was a big uh, fish die off. And the next thing people knew are all these kingfishers from all over were coming in to get these dying uh, fish and dead fish. So that's another complication. Also uh, a challenge is uh, they tend to hide when they're in the process of dying. My uh, coworker was telling me about a time he was controlling some rodents. He worked for a county in California and there was a duck farm and there were a lot of rodents not far from the duck farm. So the county went out there and they did a whole bunch of baiting uh, by a nearby creek because it was full of rodents. Next thing the county started hearing calls from homeowners. The rodents went into people's houses <laughs> in, with the, in the walls and start dying. And so you won't even see them. So they, um, it's a, quite an unfortunate thing. Also some of the challenges are, are just what the animals look like. So if you have brightly colored birds dying, we're all going to see that. But if you have little sparrows that are dying, I mean really what is the chance that, you know, we're going to be driving past an area in our car and see, you know, some dead sparrows. We're just not going to see it. 
Um, also, just vegetation, you know, depending on the type of vegetation. You have a lot of thick vegetation, you're not going to also see any kind of animals that are uh, dying. So now I'm going to talk a little more specifically about rodenticides. Uh, some rodenticides, they mo might pose a risk uh, to non-target wildlife, uh, such as hawks and owls and, and raccoons and foxes. And they're, they're not selective pesticides. And uh, there's two types, primary and secondary, two main types. So um, just to kind of give you an idea of toxicity of some of our commonly um, used rodenticides, um, if you just remember, I don't know if you've had a lot of training in LD50s, it's basically the amount of pesticide it takes to kill 50% of the population. And so the lower the number, the more toxic it is. So if you look at the first one, Brodificum, that's the active ingredient in uh, Decon and quite a number of other products, um, it is considerably more toxic, uh, toxic than something like chlorofacinone, which has the green arrow. That's the active ingredient in something called Rosol. And, um, and so that's one of the things we, we would look at. So of all of those, uh, all of these that I just showed you, all of those, uh, the, the uh, first, the only one there that is not an anticoagulant is bromethylene, and that's the last one. Out of all of those, they're all considered, um, in the category one, they're all considered the most toxic as far as uh, pesticide toxicity. And so e what EPA does is they uh, will say that if, you're, if you have uh, up to 50 milligrams per kilogram of, of animal weight, that that would be in uh, toxicity category one. And if we just think about the rodenticides we just saw, that was like 0 0.34 to 4.1 milligrams per kilogram. So they're actually into the uh, really kind of toxic group. So in primary exposure, so they can, uh, bait, they can be applied as uh, different forms of baits. So the primary exposure is if the animal is directly attracted to the bait. And we have this with like maybe ground feeding birds. We have this with geese. I have a couple slides. You might have read about um, geese getting into zinc phosphide. It's a highly unfortunate situation where they will directly consume that product. And so the risk of that happening is, is based on whether the, uh, the toxicity of it, uh, the chemical absorption, how quickly it's eliminated from the body, the uh, concentration of the active ingredient, and just basically the availability of the bait for consumption. So on the one I mentioned, brudificum bait, which is illegally used. In fact, sometimes I'll talk to growers and they'll tell me how they've experimented with this product and how great it works. And it's like, yeah, it works great, but it kills, it's, you know, it's, it's very toxic. So most of the incidences with this particular uh, bait uh, for primary exposure would be just deer eating it, squirrels, chickmunks, and, and various birds. And most of the uh, reported incidences we have are in suburban and urban areas, but you know, we think a lot of that is that's because people are walking around. If you're in a rural environment and you see a dead deer or dead bird, you're probably not going to call up somebody uh, in a, a, an authority and say, hey, I saw a dead bird. And, but if you're a, a, a homeowner type, you would. Um, that, that's not the only uh, active ingredient in, involved. So now secondary exposure is where you have the vole or, or a rat, what have you. It has eaten the rodenticide, and then along comes a coyote or a fox or a bird, and it eats that, that particular rodent that has eaten it. And it's particularly problematic when, again, that super lethal thing happens. And that's in the, the degree of secondary toxicity is really dependent on a lot of things, but if you, you would uh, have to have a fairly toxic product and one that lasted a long time in the tissues. And the ones that last a long time in the tissues are the secondary anticoagulants. 
So as far as whether it matters whether uh, something has the ability to uh, accumulate in the body, how important is that? If we look at the half-life, that means you know half of it's still left after that period of time. If we look at the half-life of certain rodenticides, uh, brodificum, the active ingredient of and, uh, decon, only half of it's eliminated after over 300 days. It's still there. And so that is kind of problematic. But if you look at something like difasinone, which is the uh, first generation anticoagulant used primarily for ground squirrel control, you know, only half of it's there after five, little over five days. And bromethylene, the nerve poison, about the same. And, you know, at one point I was kind of wondering, like, why did EPA approve the use of bromethylene for homeowner use? And then I started looking, because I thought, well, there's no antidote. This is not a good thing. But I think it's because it's getting eliminated from the body much more quickly than Brodificum, which is like absolutely the number one product that homeowners are using and other people. Um, it can be used around agricultural buildings also. That's one of the reasons I'm, I'm talking to you about it. Um, if we look at raptors and um, where are we getting uh, most of the poisoning, this, this, unfortunately the state of Oregon doesn't, we don't really test raptors that have had some tough times or maybe have died, but uh, the state of California and also the state of New York they do test their raptors, and 88% of the time, it's brodificum that's there. So this is a, don't expect you to remember this, but it, again, it's brodificum that is the uh, problem. I'll, I'll kind of go through this um, quickly. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about what you can use uh, in grapes. And the only products that you actually can legally use in your grapes would be uh, zinc phosphide products. I did a search, uh, you know, uh, Linda did a great job showing you pickle, and that's one of the first places that I went to is pickle. And I looked up rod uh, rodenticides and grapes, and I only came up with these products. I'll just show you kind of an interesting thing when you're looking at um, pesticide labels. If you look at this a second group here, the ZP rodent uh, oat bait ag and ZP ag oats, if you notice the similarity in these numbers, that the first set of numbers, 12455, is the company number. So I know that that's Bell Labs. And the second number is their product number, the 102. And I can tell by this that ZP Ag Oats is actually a distributor label that basically Bell Labs has told another company called it's actually called Matomco that yes you can register you can uh, register not register our product but you can sell our product and we'll let you do that so you actually don't have as many products as you maybe even think you have. Um, there is a chlorofastinone product that's first generation anticoagulant that can be used in border areas. But if you have a lot of raptors in your border areas, then you really have to evaluate. You know, it is a legal option, but you have to evaluate if it's a product that you want to uh, use. But if you don't have a lot of raptors and you are getting bait aversion to zinc phosphide because zinc phosphide doesn't taste very good, then that's something that you could consider it'd be a legal use. Um, what these labels uh, say, and rodenticide labels are the only ones that say this. They say for use only for the sites, which I think, I think most of us who are, or are um, um, a licensed pesticide users, we know that the label is the law. You have to have the site on the label before you can use it. But the rodenticide labels also say for only for use for those pests. So if you had a label that it was uh, approved for use for rats and mice, that you can't legally use it for voles and ground squirrels and other types of rodents. This is a big contrast. So if you had Let's say you had an insecticide for use on one of your major grape pests, and you had another grape insect pest, 
and uh, you could legally use it because the way the labels are, it's really for sight, except for these rodenticide labels. So the zinc phosphide labels have, say, for control of meadow, prairie, and pine voles, and white-footed mouse, and meadow jumping mice. So this means that if you had uh, pocket gophers or you had something else and that was your target, that it would not be a legal use. If you were going for voles and you had a couple of ground, squ or ground squirrels or gophers die, um, you know, nobody, it wouldn't be an enforcement issue, but you really your target has to be the pest that's on the label. This one has really only broadcast baiting on it too, which is kind of interesting because a lot of labels have below ground options and broadcast options. This one states broadcast evenly on the ground between the rows, so that not within the rows, between the rows, uh, using a cyclone seeder or by hand and applied six to ten pounds per acre and do not apply by air. There are a lot of labels that allow you to apply by air on different crops but not on grapes. And also a lot of crops have uh, pre-harvest intervals stated on them. Interestingly enough, this one does not. So it appears that you could use it at any time of the year, but you just couldn't get it onto the the actual grape itself, the actual uh, foliage. What happens sometimes is that because it's a pellet, sometimes it's a pelletized and other times it's a grain bait, that it physically becomes lodged in the crop. And you think, well, you know, I applied that two months ago, how could that be? But it's still sitting there, <laughs> especially when, during our dry summers. You know, during the uh, springtime, the, uh, if, you, if it gets rained upon, it actually will deactivate it. But it's so it could actually physically get lodged. This is a problem in, in certain crops like wheat. It's a, uh, actually quite a problem. And so they're restricted as far as when they can harvest, uh, uh, apply it. And so there's a very clear pre-harvest interval on that. So of all the rodenticides that we have registered in the United States, zinc phosphide has the most bait shyness problem. And so sometimes people don't apply enough and they just put a little bit out there. And so, it's, it, so because there's so little of it, maybe the vole or the mouse doesn't have access to enough pellets to kill it, but it has access to enough pellets to make it sick and it will not go back to it again. So we tell people to use the full labeled rate on that. Um, there is a pre-baiting that can take place. So let's say you do decide you want to use the oat bait formulation, that you would go out there with an oat bait that had not been treated with zinc phosphide, get them to like the oat bait, like, wow, this is a great thing to eat, full of protein. <laughs> And, um, you know, do that for a while, get them kind of acclimated, and then you put out the toxic bait. And that's pre-baiting. This is for people who, you know, you have a serious problem, you have workers that are getting injured from falling in holes and stuff, and you feel the need to do something. Um, the label also states not to apply to bare ground. Um, this makes it, if you do apply it to bare ground, it becomes very attractive to birds. And so this is actually on the label, and the label is the law. Now we have had some incidences in the Willamette Valley with zinc phosphide. Uh, we haven't had any confirmed cases of migratory birds that have been killed by zinc phosphide since April 2011. Um, and I put migratory because this fall we actually got a call from uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and there were some dead uh, geese, not migratory geese, over by the state prison and in some other areas. So we never found out where they got into the zinc phosphide. Uh, it's very possible somebody didn't like the geese and knew that zinc phosphide was effective as far as for some reason geese are particularly sensitive to zinc phosphide. 
This is kind of a gross picture, but we actually had, a, uh, there was actually a paper written about uh, the incidences that we had in Oregon. This is one of the geese that they found that uh, had died and they did a necropsy on it. And one of the things that they want to do is they want to see, you know, what had this geese been eating before it, you know, fell. We had some, actually some geese falling on somebody's garage, dying from it. So I, I am, uh, hate to go too much in this. Um, EPA made some changes to some commensal uh, rodenticide labels and commensal rodents are your rats and mice. You know, a lot of times I think when people think of farming and rodenticides, they're thinking of the crop, but there are a lot of rodenticides used around people's agricultural buildings where you have stored uh, product. You know, you see all these seed warehouses, these grass seed warehouses. Uh, food processors, There's a, there are a lot of rodenticides associated with the, the food industry. And they uh, enacted some uh, mitigation measures because they are having basically too many children under the age of six get into rodenticides, and then there were wildlife uh, uh, incidences. And basically when they traced back what was going on, it was because people weren't following the label and they were allowing exposure to take place. So as far as ag buildings, bait stations are required for all outdoor above ground placements. So you won't be able to, if you get a label that allows you to use rodenticides around an agricultural building, you won't be able to just put that particular rodenticide on the ground. These are your more toxic pesticides, so or, or rodenticides. So the rodenticide that you're allowed to use in the field is a lot of times very different than the ones you can use around a building because the EPA doesn't want those really toxic ones to go out into the field. Um, a bait station is required indoors. If there's any possibility of uh, animals or kids or non-target animals getting into it. Um, I urge you if you have any cats not to use anticoagulant rodenticides. Um, I've heard some bad stories. Um, and it, the label will say for use around agricultural buildings and it will prohibit use around homes. That's something that didn't happen before but that's part of this mitigation measures. And also, uh, rodenticides that you might be able, you used to be able to get at like a big box store, let's say you just wanted a little bit, you're not going to be able to get those at those big box stores or your local hardware stores. You're only going to be able to get these that have agricultural uses. You're only going to be get, get those at an ag store like, you know, Wilco or someplace like that. So the types of rodenticides that you can use around agricultural buildings are your second generation uh, ones, and those are now only being sold in containers of eight pounds or more. So no more little small sizes. And there is a lawsuit going on right now with the makers of, of Decon in uh, EPA. There's there's an issue going on because. They're, they're not making changes like a lot of registrants are making. So you might still sometimes see some of this, these products in your big box store, your local hardware store, but they shouldn't be there. Um, and you can, any form is available, uh, acceptable. They're taking away pellets from the homeowner market, but for the agricultural building market, they'll still have blocks and also pellets available. So um, there will also be first generation anticoagulants available and then the non-anticoagulants. And for these, you can buy these in smaller sizes. You can buy these in four pound sizes and you don't, wouldn't have to just get the eight pound size. And again, bait station would be required for outdoor uh, use and if there's indoor use where some, there could be some type of exposure, a bait station would be required. So um, back to this vitamin D3 product. This is an example of a product that is for use only to control Norway rats, roof rats, and house mice within 100 feet of agricultural buildings and man-made structures. 
you might see labels out there. In fact, it's very likely you will see labels that instead of saying 100 feet within agricultural buildings and man-made structures, that it will say within 50 feet of buildings. And that's it. So if you have a need uh, to apply it outside of 50 feet, you will want to get a newer label. You'll need to get a product with a newer label. EPA ended up changing a bunch of labels because food processors and other people said, you know, we don't, we put our dumpster more than 50 feet away from the building because we don't want rodents and we want to be able to treat those rodents further away from building the building. We don't want to attract them. There, uh, uh, one of the things that was happening with some of these labels is that people would consider the, the fence a structure and they would just keep putting this material way far away from the building. So actually that has been prohibited that you can't go beyond 100 uh, feet and that the product also can't be applied uh, directly to, to uh, food or feed. There is some allowance with this product that if you had rats or mice and you had burrows and you had verified rats or mice that you could apply it beyond the 100 feet. The label will allow you to do that. But I wouldn't really suggest it. I mean, we still have secondary poisoning issues and that's again just for rats and mice. As far as uh, forms of bait, uh, there are blocks versus pellets. Pellets can be moved a lot more easily into a, a, a location that uh, might allow exposure to non-target uh, pests or non-target uh, wildlife. Um, but uh, there are some rodents that don't like those blocks and they prefer the pellets. And so you're going to have to kind of weigh your particular situation to know that, you know, the, that the block will be a little bit safer because a rodent can't take this big block and move it to another location, but if, depending on the severity of your problem, and uh, both will be legal. Um, I think I'm just going to stop it there. This is just about bait boxes as far as, unless you guys, do you guys want to hear about bait boxes? No? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, just basically, you know, I think, uh, you know, when EPA looks at this, they look at, and, and so do we, uh, we look at the benefit versus the risk. And so we just ask for uh, people to do the same. Well, thank you so much. And sorry if my head sounds really clogged too. <laughs> thank you.